James chapter 4. I got to get rolling because I ran a little long last service. We're going to dive right into it. If you have your Bible. Now, I grew up in a church where that was never a question. If you have your Bible. My dad would always stand up on Sunday morning and he would say, having your Bibles with you, turn with me to... And so I want to challenge you this week. I know it gets real simple because we throw it up on the screen and, and, and a lot of you may have, and if you got it on your phone, I'm down. I'm okay with that. So long as like, if you're on your phone watching the Bible, that you're watching the Bible and not Netflix, <laughs> that's awkward. Okay. Um, wouldn't be the first time, but, uh, but I, I, I want, I'm, I'm just, maybe just a request for you going into the fall, fall in love with the word of God. I know it sounds like super elementary Christian stuff, like we're in church, of course you're going to say that. Now listen, the Bible is the greatest book ever written, right. not just because that it's the great, but it is, it's the word of God. And I truly believe that every answer that you will ever need for anything in your life is found there. And so I want to challenge you, get in your word, get in the Bible. How many have been reading James the last couple of weeks? Been good for you? How many of you are learning some stuff from James the last couple of weeks? I am learning to love this guy more and more. I used to at times go, man, I'm just like, I'm just like the apostle Peter. You know, they, they tell, say that Peter was the disciple with the foot shaped mouth. Cause like he would constantly say something and boom, stick his foot right in his mouth. I am learning to love James, man. Just his, his honest approach to the things of God. And I think it, it scares a lot of people because he is so honest with it. And, and, and we would now go, oh, he's just so bold. He's not necessarily being bold as much as he is just being honest. And we, we struggle with that now. We, we, we kind of we want to work through last night. We were getting ready for bed and, and Bren was there. And, and I, walk, I walked through the bathroom as Bren's getting ready to take her shower and get ready for, get cleaned up so that it makes Sunday morning easier. Everybody has their routine. And, and I walked through, how many of you know kids can be honest? And I walk through to go to my closet, so I'm walking through the bathroom to get to the closet in the back, and as I walk through there and I come back through, I hear Bryn go, Mama, Daddy sure has a big belly. <laughs> and I received that uh, in grace and humility, and I laughed about it, and, I, and, and immediately I thought of James, and I thought... I think that's probably something James would say, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm, learning, I'm learning to love him. So James chapter 4 is where we're going to be. We're going to take some references out of Romans. We're going to take some references out of the book of John, but if you want to live right here, you can. James chapter 4 is not a long chapter. If you dove into it this week, it is not long, but man, there is some gut punch stuff. Some of it we'll get to. Some of it I may grab later on. We'll see. But uh, starting out, we see that James gives us, the first three chapter, James kind of is pastoral to us. Us. He's kind of going, hey, this is how you ought to live out your life. This is how you ought to, to uh, you function as a believer. May, watch your mouth, chapter three. You know, keep a handle on this tongue that we've got. It's going to get you in a lot of trouble uh, like it does everybody, but kind of keep a grasp on it. Then in chapter four, he kind of shifts and goes, hey, the reason I'm having to tell you how to act is because we keep falling to the same enemies. And so in chapter four, he lists our three enemies that we face. I, I, enjoy, I, don't, I, I enjoy a good debate. I enjoy a good uh, back and forth discussion. But before I get in a back and forth discussion, I want to know what, what the problem is. I, I just don't want a random argument unless I know kind of where we're heading. And so I see this James is kind of going, hey, I've told you how to act and how to live out your faith and your actions and, and the, your, or your belief and your actions. I've told you to kind of watch your mouth, but, but I, want, I want to give you the why. I want to give you the why these things are happening. There's a story, anybody hear the War of the Oaken Bucket? Probably not. It's not a big war. It didn't make a lot of news, okay? But back in the day in what's now Italy, there was a, a, a village, Medina, there's a place in Italy, Medina, and Medina, the people of Medina went into the neighboring city of, uh, I think it was Bologna, and they went in and they stole the bucket from the well. That's all they did, stole the bucket, an oak bucket. The people of Bologna got upset, and of course, they did what any rational people do. They got their army together, 
and they marched against Medina, and Medina marched back against Bologna, and 2,000 people died over a bucket. Now, how many of you know that the war or the battle really wasn't over the bucket? That it was more about our pride and, and what they thought, you, you don't get to come in here and take our bucket, and so we're gonna come at you. And so this pride that, that happened here cost the lives of many. And I'm gonna tell you, ultimately, by the time we land the plane today, pride is where we'll land. And we are amazing at it. Would anybody just admit it and go, I'm pretty prideful? Anybody? Okay. The rest of you, too proud to admit it. <laughs> Walked right into that one, didn't you? It's, it's a struggle for us. Uh, there's a great book out that, that I, I give away to people that are really truly searching and it's, it's called Leading from Your Dark Side by Gary McIntosh. And this idea of pride and, and how we will lead sometimes out of a dark side issue that we have, whether that's narcissism or passive aggressiveness or codependency, it's, it's really powerful. I, I read four to five books a month and typically when I read this book, it takes me six months because I throw it against the wall about every two weeks, mad at it because it's revealed, peeled. Do so, you ever have something like that? You, just, you love it, but you hate it. Some of you are like, that's how I feel about working out. You're crazy. But this book is really good. And so it, I, I just, I love this wrestling match we have with pride because it's always there. No matter if you've been a believer for 50 years, you still wrestle with pride. In fact, what we would see if we looked at our culture today, we wouldn't see the church acting like the church of Jesus Christ. We would see kind of a prideful model is what we're seeing more than anything. This that we've got it figured out and the rest of you better figure it out. And, and it's, not, it's not really becoming, it's not who Christ was at any part of his ministry. And so today I want to just walk through these, these enemies because I think as long as we uncover the enemy, as long as we understand that our, our battle in this world is not just with the things that we see, it's not the bucket, There's, there are enemies that are, that are there. The first one is he dives into it in the very first verse of chapter four. Let's go there. James chapter four, verse one. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this? that your passions are at war within you. Wouldn't it have been so easy if it would have said, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Those idiots that surround you. <laughs> Can I get an amen on that translation? <laughs> like you're like, I don't know if I should. Vince just changed the Bible. No, I, I, they're not gonna let my version in there, all right? But, but we feel that way, don't we? Where we would, it's just easier to blame someone else. But James goes, no, no, no. The reason these things happen aren't because of outside things. They're because of things within you. Your need to be right. Your, your fleshly desires. In another place, we see that this would have been called the flesh. We see Paul talk about the flesh, the, the me. You know, and sometimes the, oh, I heard a pastor say it this, say this time, one time, he said that the greatest in the enemy is the inner me. This, this me that I fight with it, that I, that I fall to these temptations and it's not even necessarily temptations that are overwhelming. They're just, they're just fleshly desires. It's my anger. It's my attitude. It's my, my perception on things. And, and I wrestle with these things. I wrestle with this flesh of mine, just like you wrestle with this flesh of yours. And you go, yeah, this flesh stuff's bad. So often we think I grew up where anytime you talked about the flesh, you were automatically talking about lust. And that's what we must be talking about is, you know, yes, you're getting your flesh, you're just lusting after everything. The thing I'm finding as I get older, the things that I lust after are not physical. It's, it's not just this, this outside flesh. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not pursuing another woman or anything like that in my mind or in my life, but the things that I do pursue, success and notoriety and a lot of those traits that we have, our fleshly traits. We chase those things. We, you know, we're not good at self-control, as I mentioned a few weeks ago. How, how many of you have ever ate too much? 
right? And you justify it because like you'll, you'll push back after the main course. You'll go, whew, oh, I just couldn't eat another thing. And about the time you get halfway through the sentence, they walk by with the dessert menu and there's that seven layer chocolate thing that they offer. And you're like, <laughs> well, since we're here, <laughs> I know I shouldn't, but how many times has that phrase come to your mind? I know I shouldn't, but if, it's, if you've ever thought that about anything, that's a fleshly desire. That's the flesh working itself out in you. And there's this constant battle between the spirit and the flesh. But God is pretty clear about the flesh and the spirit when he lays this down in Romans. And, and if you dig into Romans, you're going to see this a lot. As the, as the writer says this for verse 6 in chapter 8 of Romans, says, For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It's pushing him away. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So you, you, you can't be chasing your own desires and be following God. You can't be chasing this fleshly urges that you have and then go, but it's all for the glory of the kingdom. It's a, it's a mess in here when we start looking at ourselves as, the, as an enemy. Because I look at myself in the mirror and let me just be straight with you. I'm pretty fond of me. I like me. I like me a lot. Fellas, how many of you remember being 15 years old and walking by a mirror in your house? Back when, I remember back when I had hair, I'd, t- I'd stop in every mirror, man. <laughs> flip that hair. I, st- like, my, I still know how to do it, and there's nothing to flip. <laughs> so funny with teenage boys in the house. I'll see them. My daughters used to do the messy bun for school. Like I had, my, all my daughters were involved in sports, so like their attire was pretty sporty. I don't know how else to say it. Like my, my girls grew up where like they wore sweats to school every day. And now when they wanted to get dressed up, they, they did, but they would call it a messy bun. I'm like, messy bun means messy bun. No, no, no. You had to get the messy bun right. I'm like, if it's a messy bun, this doesn't make any sense. What's got, I don't want it to look dumb. You just call it a messy bun. They'd spend some time on it because even the messy stuff we want to look right because we're prideful in this flesh that's in us and it doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. We, 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 we chase after these feelings that, that come from within us and they're not always healthy. When you are the center of your world, this will be your greatest enemy. Don't you know that the reason there's fightings and quarrelings is because of the stuff that's in you? It's, it's, no, no, don't blame it on the broken world. The world is broken. And I love this. I, it's, I love it and it frustrates me. I love it from a preaching standpoint that you and I get so frustrated and so angry and so mad at the world for being the world. What else are they going to be? Right. If they don't know Jesus, they're going to be the world. There's no point in us getting mad about it. What we need to do is live a life that shows them another option. But unless we get outside of our flesh, it won't be another option. It will just kind of look the same, which leads us to our second enemy. The second enemy he brings up in verse six, or verse four through six of this passage in James chapter four, verse four. He says, you adulterous people. This, don't hold anything back, James. Tell us really what you think. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it's to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made dwell in us? You say, I don't understand that. So here's what happens. You get saved. The spirit of God comes and dwells in you. God knows this. That's how this process works. But as a believer, the spirit that lives within us is in constant battle and God is jealous for that spirit to be first. He says, no, this is what should rise to the top. This is what should be first in your life. It's my spirit. And yet you continue to chase what the world says is okay. 
You continue to chase. We, we look at a society around us and we go, man, the world is broken, but as long as you know, it doesn't affect me, I really don't have any problem with it. We ought to have a problem with a broken world. We should have had a problem with the broken world since Genesis chapter three. But what I find is that we step back as the church and go, I just don't wanna get involved in it because if I get involved in it, I'm gonna look like the rest of the church that the world hates. Let me just clarify this for you. The world is going to hate the church whether it gets involved or doesn't get involved. It's just going to. Some of you may not be up for that fight and, and I, don't, I don't get to judge you either way on that. What I am saying is though you need to be prepared because I believe it's gonna get a lot harder for the church before it gets any easier for the church. Because of the world around us is broken. I, Genesis chapter three, you see this, where, where the devil just does such a great job of spinning this in Eve's mind. And from that moment on, from that moment where that, that fruit was eaten and shame entered in, the world has been doing its best from that moment to destroy itself. And what we've done over history and centuries is we've gotten better and better and better at destroying ourselves. Do you know now the suicide rate has replaced the homicide rate on cause of death? We don't, need even, we don't even need help anymore. We're doing it to ourselves. Do you know the suicide rate in the church is equal to the suicide rate outside the church? And we have the answer. Something is getting lost in the delivery. Something is getting lost in the delivery. And so when we look at this idea of the world, we have to make sure we understand that the Bible teaches this idea. And Jesus even taught us the world, hey, you're going to be in the world. Don't be, don't be of the world. You can be separate. The idea of holiness is to come out from among them and be separate. Be separate. You ought to look different. It ought to be different than the rest of the world. Yeah, but Vincent, if I'm different, then people are going to notice. Yes! That's the point. I don't know if I want people looking at me. Sorry! It's like saying, I want to drive this car. Well, I, I just don't want to use keys, though. You have affinity to gas pedals, so do you have something that I can drive without actually accelerating? No, it's not an option. Could it be an option? No. No, to go from this point to that point, you're going to have to accelerate. And so it's not an option. Christians, please hear me in this. And this is not me telling you to be an introvert or an extrovert, to be a go-getter or uh, none of that matters in this. You just don't get to choose to be hidden. One of my favorite places in Mountain Home and I think of this, this passage every time I, if you're coming from Mountain Hall or from Walmart and you're driving back into town, you can be driving down 62, you're going to pass the auto parts store and there's, then there's Burger King and over here is this, the furniture store that's been 27 different furniture stores. How many of you know where I'm talking about? All right, you got it. Good. Everybody's with me. But when you crest that hill and you come down and you get to the top, if you catch that just at the right time of day, whether it's sunrise or sunset, the lights of the city are starting to come on. You can look over here and you can see the hospital. You can look over here and you can see where the highway turns and goes down into the square. You can look right in the middle and there's the golden arches. <laughs> it's like I'm taking you there with me, isn't it? <laughs> but from the moment I felt God calling me back to this area, this verse... Jesus is sitting up above the city of Jerusalem and he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you in underneath my wing like a mother hen does her chicks, but you, you would not hear my cry. And from the moment God called me to come to Mountain Home and when, when, when I get right there, every time, even now, we've been here 11 years as a church, even now when I crest that hill, I think, God, am I, am I telling them, 
Am I making sure that real life is a safe place? Am I making sure that your gospel is clear? Am I making sure, because sometimes it don't matter, it won't matter how clear I make it or how safe this place is, they won't hear the cry, but I can't stop crying out. And neither should you. The world is big and ugly and broken. But you and I are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And therefore, we have the answer. I got to move quickly into this last enemy because he's the obvious one, right? If, if you're one enemy, the world is another enemy. The obvious third enemy is what? Say it. Satan. Satan. The devil. He gets there in chapter, in chapter 4 too. Chapter 4, verse 6. But God gives more grace. This is, what, this is after... If you're studying the Bible, this is going to be, we're we're going to take a little sidebar here from the sermon. If you're studying the Bible, please, please be cautious of just reading the verses based on the numbers. Okay? Because this is an awful, grammatically, this is a bad break right here. Because the verse starts with, but he gives more grace. The but is for the sentence before it where he's talking about you adulterous people. Know you not that there's a reason that God said this, that my spirit is jealous for the spirit that's within you. But even though it's jealous, he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The devil is the third enemy, but I want you to hear the process in defeating him. You say, Vince, it doesn't say defeating him. You're right, it says resisting him. You and I, in our own strength, have zero ability to defeat the devil. I'm going to tell you something, and I hope maybe you've been told this in your church life, but again, you've been lied to. The devil is not intimidated by you at all. Not at all. He's not intimidated by me. But there is something within me that makes him shake. And it is the grace of God. It is the grace of God. So the scripture is actually, Dom, put it back up there if you would. That verse six and verse seven. If you just go to verse seven, I think. Yeah, verse seven. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Go back to verse six. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. I want a saint hang out right here. God says, hey, I need you to be humble. I, I don't need you to be prideful because pride is going to make you fall. In fact, it tells us that in the book of Proverbs. The pride cometh before the fall. The moment you think you're the stuff, you will be shown to not be the stuff. Okay, you guys heard me tell this story about our high school baseball team, Coach Don Webb, Coach C. Boy, we went to Harrison because that was our rival, and we showed up, and we did what's called phantom infield. We took infield without a baseball. You say, how do you do that? You pretend and use your imagination. So the coaches would throw up an imaginary baseball, they would hit an imaginary ground ball, and we would field an imaginary ground ball, throw to first, first baseman would splits out, throw dirt everywhere, outfielders were diving in the grass. We looked like we had played three double headers in our uniforms by the time we were done with imaginary infield. And the whole idea was to go, we don't even need a ball to beat you. Five innings in, we're up 11 to one beating the snot out of them. And our pitcher fell completely apart. We ended up losing that game 13 to 11. Oh yeah, it was awful. You talk about a bus ride home, boy. That was a long one. And we, our, our pride got responded to. I don't know if that was a divine moment, but as a preacher, I'm looking back at it going, okay, I get it, God. But our pride, God says, here, do you wanna, if you want to know how to defeat the devil, A, you need to understand something about the devil. You are not his main priority. What? Does that mean I can't say the devil's just been tearing me? Just, devil's just been all up in my face all day long. Well, A, if you think that, you're arrogant because you don't know the devil. Let me, let me show you how the devil works. Becca, I'm, you're here, so I'm going to have you come ahead. Ask me to help me. Claire, come on. 
So in this scenario, I get to be the devil because no one would believe they are, okay? So here, face me, Claire. You guys will all just face this way. So here's the devil's plan. Here's what the devil does. I know what we think the devil does is he gets right here and he camps out all day. And I'm going to pick on Claire and I'm going to get in Claire's way and I'm going to mess with Claire. And I'm going to bring other things in Claire's life to mess with Claire. I'm just going to stay right here and mess with Claire all day long. That's what we say he does, right? The devil's just been, he's just been after me. The devil's been, oh, no, listen, you are not that important to the devil. You know what the devil's goal with you is? Destroy. He seeks so that he can destroy. He roams to and fro so that he sees who he can devour. The end game with you and the devil is not that he's sitting there going, oh, I wonder what Claire's gonna do today. No, he just wants you dead. He's not sitting around going, I wonder what, no, he just wants me dead. And so what the devil does is he doesn't come in here and spend all day with Claire. What he does is because he knows Claire has two other enemies, herself and the world. He'll drop a temptation in front of Claire and he'll go, boy, if I can get Claire to kind of focus on this temptation, guess what? She's not walking towards Jesus. And I can come back here to Aspen and I go, you know what? If I can get Aspen just a little bit out of a line with where God wants her to be, then she's not walking towards Jesus. And you know, I, I think Becca may be trying to lean into God, but if I drop this temptation right here and all I got to do is get her to just look down and not do anything else. Watch. If this is where Jesus is in your life, by just moving through the line, the devil has already made ground. But he's convinced us that he spends all his time on us. Why? Because you and I are prideful and we still think it's all about us. Jesus said, listen, verse six, put it back up there, Dom. Verse six. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the what, church? Because he can, if you'll be humble. How, do, how am I supposed to be humble, Pastor Vince? You go to verse seven. You submit yourself unto God. God, here I am, I'm yours. If Claire says, God, here I am, I'm yours, then the devil gets right here in Claire's life and goes, nope. He doesn't stop. He doesn't have time. There is a war he's trying to win even though he knows he loses. That's why the Bible says if you will humble yourself to God and resist the devil, as long as Aspen stands firm in who she is in Christ, as the devil, I'm not wasting my time. Why? Because she's made a decision to stand firm, so I'm moving on. And if Becca makes a decision to stand firm, the devil's moving on. It's not that he's scared of you, it's that he's scared of the faith in Christ that you have. And so long as they stand firm, we see this in the armor of God, with breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation, feet guard with the truth, loin, all this stuff. And at the end of it, it says, and having done all you can do to stand, stand, therefore. That's what the word resist means. It doesn't mean push away. If Claire tries to push me away as the devil, guess what? She loses every time. Because although I don't believe the enemy, I don't believe the devil has access to Claire unless Claire gives access, what the enemy does is he's got this notebook and he knows everything that has caused Claire to slip in the past. And that's what he'll just throw down in front of her. Yeah, I'll just try to make her slip. I'll just try to make her slip. Here's the reality about Lucifer. If pride was able to take Lucifer out of heaven, don't think for a second that pride can't take heaven out of you. He was next to God. And pride got him. You guys give it up for my help up here. Thank you, guys. So often, we miss this reality of pride in our lives. Christians, we ought to be the least prideful people. I am what I am by the grace of God. By the grace of God, I have what I have. There is absolutely, absolutely no reason on the planet Jennifer should have said yes to a date with me. <laughs> Those of you that are friends and families in real life, you know why. I ask my wife out like this. If no one else wants to go with me, would you like to go on a date? That was how I asked her out. <laughs> Ladies. 
In what world does that work? Grace of God. Grace of God. We got in a fight. Got in a fight. I was leaving for, I was, had my truck parked in the street. I was leaving, running across the yard. She was following me. I turned around. I said, are we done? And she said, no. I said, do you want to get married? She said, yeah. And I said, all right, I'll see you later. And I got in the truck and I left. No ring, no getting down on the knee, no photo shoot for the surprise proposal. That would be awesome to recreate that for Instagram now, wouldn't it be like... Vince walking away, Jennifer going like this. This was our proposal. So, write that down. We're going to try that later. That's going to be fun. The grace of God is what allows me to have what I have. And if I allow the pride to seep in, then I cannot win against myself. I cannot defeat the world. And I cannot win against the enemy. So I humble myself before this God and I say, God, I'm so I cannot do any of this without you. I cannot pastor this church without you. I cannot lead my family without you. I can't love my wife without you. I can't raise my kids without you. God, I can't, I can't even be a good friend to people without you. And so God, I humble myself before you and say, whatever you need from me today, I'm yours. I'm your, God, I'm yours. And it's not easy to stand in a world that's broken. Pastor Vince, I just don't I, don't, I know what I should do, but just sometimes it doesn't, listen, if you have your Bible, I'm gonna challenge you to slide all the way down to the very last verse in the book of James, chapter four. I'll give you the King James version because that's the one I grew up memorizing. It says for him to know, or for him that knows to do good and does not do it, it is sin. What does that mean? I started trying to dig into it. Like, what God? No, you can be just as sinful by stepping back as you would be by stepping in and doing the wrong thing. Church, he needs us involved. He needs us engaged, but he needs us humble. It's not easy to stand your ground. It's not easy. My daughter went to probably one of the most liberal schools in the country to college. Pastor Vince, why would you send your kid to a liberal school? I'm not talking just politically liberal. I'm talking morally liberal, socially liberal. You ask for it, they've probably figured out some way to support it. Somebody said, well, how are you okay with that? And I said, one reason, one, one reason and one reason only. I said, as a parent, if I've done my job of training my kids in whose they are, then they will never question who they are. No matter the environment, no matter the world around them, no matter the battle within self, I know I am his. My question to you today is simply this. Do you know that you are his? Does the world know that you are his? And is the devil even concerned that you are his? Because you'll know, you'll know if the devil wants any part of you or he's not worried about you. It's a little sweet lady named Virgie Simpson. I tell this story often because... I haven't written my, my preaching Bible. This is the Bible that when I first started preaching, Ms. Virgie was a little old lady in my first church that I grew up in here in Mountain Home. Virgie would sit on that front row, second, she sat on the second row about where you're sitting every week. She'd just smile. And I got ready to leave for the mission field when right out of high school, I moved to Los Angeles, started doing mission work out of, out of LA, all across the country. And uh, Virgie came to me and I said, Miss Virgie, I said, I need you to pray for me. She said, oh, I'm praying for you. And I said, you're praying for me? She said, I pray for you every day, Vince. And Virgie's the one that gave me my verse. I call it my verse. 
Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, have I not commanded you be strong and of good courage. Don't be afraid or confused for the Lord your God is with you no matter where you go. She gave me that just before I got on a plane. But this one Sunday we were sitting in church and I said, Virgie, how do you get up every day? I was a high school kid, high school senior, and I'm asking this lady who's in her 80s how she does it. Because, man, she was just a rock in the faith for me. When I look back and I think of godly people, I see Miss Virgie Simpson. And she smiled at me with that kind of mischievous grin. And she said, Vince, when I get up every morning, when I get up every morning and my feet hit the floor, I said, yeah. She said, I want all of hell to shake because I'm awake. And I just like lit me on fire because I thought, this lady, I, I don't know if she could sprint to the back door of the church. But in her faith and in her walk with God, she knows that the devil's coming at her, but that's all right because tomorrow morning she's going to get up, she's going to put one foot on the ground and the spirit of God's going to be with her. She's going to put the other foot down and the grace of God is going to be with her. And she's going to walk into the day knowing that you don't get to come against me, Satan, because I'm going to stand in who I am and who Christ is. And you have to flee. You have to flee. You don't, you don't get to tempt me with the everyday stuff because I'm stronger than that in Jesus. Amen. I don't fall to the same tricks that I used to because I'm stronger than that in Jesus. Church, do you know whose you are? Does the world around you know whose you are? And is the enemy even worried? about whose you are. Bow with me, church.